So I'm going to move over here. Is that okay with the camera guy? Because I know Nick is going to watch this later. <laughs> Everybody turn around and say, hi, Nick. Hi. Yeah, yeah, you need to come back to work now. <laughs> well, it is good to be with you. And again, what a gift you have given to your pastor to have a sabbatical time to study and to learn and to grow. And he and I have been in conversation. And I know that he's been traveling and learning about ministry and how congregations have grown and continue to grow, and how mission congregations, and uh, I am grateful to hear, I will look forward to hearing what he has learned, and then seeing it put into action amongst you all here at Abiding Grace. It is good to be back with you. Um, it feels a little bit like a home game for me, because I've been here a bunch of times since, uh, since I was elected bishop, but I, even, I remember the day we dedicated this space. Uh, I was the dean of the Metro Plus West Conference at the time, and I remember coming here as we dedicated this house to worship. And what a wonderful thing to see how you have continued to develop that and grow that uh, here, and uh, we are grateful for your ministry. The last time I was here was for Catherine's ordination, and what a joy that was that this young congregation could raise up a leader to serve the church, and she is now serving faithfully a good shepherd in Irving, and we are grateful for that opportunity for her. But I did talk to your pastor this week, and before I get into my sermon time, uh, he asked me to speak to you a little bit about what happened at our ELCA churchwide assembly that we just had in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, so he told me to talk to you about this. I tried not to cause my pastor's grief when I go, and I talked to them about what I'm going to say. Uh, but uh, he wanted me to, to say a couple words of clarification, and then as you all are going to have some time of conversation. The first thing I want to say is churchwide assembly was an amazing event. Uh, I had never gotten to go to a churchwide assembly. I had to get elected bishop to get to go to a churchwide assembly. So I went to my first one three years ago in New Orleans, and, and, and people would ask me from our delegation, they said, well, what do we do, bishop? And I'm like, I don't know. I haven't been here either, right? But we all learn together. But one of the things that we see when you come to a churchwide assembly, there are 900-plus other voting members from a synod, 65 synods. Uh, there are representatives from the Lutheran World Federation, you are part of a federation of Lutheran churches around the world, 145 member congregations, 70 million plus Lutherans around the world. And here's the thing. The majority of those Lutherans live south of the equator. When we think of Lutheranism, we tend to think of Scandinavia and Germany. Well, guess what? The Lutheran church has grown and thrives around the world. And so we got to hear from Archbishop Philibus from Nigeria, the Lutheran Church of Christ in Nigeria, which is a fast-growing witness in Nigeria to the gospel of Jesus Christ in our Lutheran confessional way. What a joy that was. We got to talk to 200 of our federal chaplains. The ELCA has 200 pastors who are employed as federal chaplains, serving alongside our service people, deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan, deployed around the world, serving closer to home. It is an amazing ministry. And here's the thing, friends. The U.S. Army and military, they want our chaplains because they know that Lutheran pastors are well-trained and Lutheran pastors are ecumenical and are willing to work interreligiously. And so they want our chaplains. We got to dedicate a new prison prayer book, something I know that is deep in the heart of this community with your connections to Church of the Damascus Road. We dedicated a prison prayer book that we're going to have to give to those who are incarcerated to bring hope in the midst of their challenges. It was a wonderful time when we gave thanks for the gifts of the African Descent Lutheran Association. And we also talked honestly about the fact that we as a church haven't always invested in our black churches the way we need to. And that that's something we as a church need to do better at. We talked about mission and ministry. We heard about mission congregations. Well, you guys almost don't count anymore as a mission congregation, you know? We expect you to help start new mission congregations. But that, we talked about how that's growing and thriving in places. And we talked about challenges that we face as a denomination, the reality of finances. You know, it always has to come down to money. We talk about money, right? That's reality. But we also talked about the abundance that we have and the way we're lurking to work. That said, the only thing that made the news, really, out of our assembly was a memorial with a declaration about sanctuary. That's what got on the news. That's okay. We understand that. We're not naive. We know these things are going to happen. 
and there was a memorial that was brought forward from the Metro New York Synod around immigration. The memorial was related to encouraging the work that the ELCA through Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, the ELCA is doing with our Amparo Initiative, working with undocumented and also unaccompanied minors, kids who show up at the border through our social service agencies, things that we're doing for serving our neighbor Added, so that's what, that was the memorial. And then added to that memorial and the course of conversation. Any of y'all ever been to a meeting with 900 people doing Robert's Rules? <laughs> it's a thing, y'all. Uh, things get added. Things get talked about. And it was added to that. There was an amendment added that said the ELCA will declare itself to be a sanctuary denomination. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, we had some debate about that, and it came very clear that 900 people are not going to be able to wordsmith a, a definition of what that means. And so in that, a second piece that was added to that, that the ELCA Churchwide Council would be charged with determining what does this mean for us to say this about ourselves. And that they would study that and they would do work on that and they would report back to our Churchwide Assembly, which will be in Columbus, Ohio in three years. Now the good news, hi Nick, you got yourself elected to the Churchwide Council. <laughs> so your pastor is going to be part of that work. But a couple of things I want to say very clearly, because there's been some misinformation shared. Um, it's unfortunate that the media often likes to talk about people rather than talk to people. Uh, there was a media report on the Sunday after our assembly on Fox and Friends, Robert Jeffress from First Baptist in Dallas, he likes to be on TV, um, talking about us. They did not ask the ELCA for comment. They did not invite anyone from the ELCA to be there. They did not ask us for talking points. They just talked about us. And in so doing, they raised the anxiety level of a lot of us, including the Conference of Bishops. Okay, that's reality. What it doesn't mean is the ELSA Churchwide Assembly does not have the authority to tell you as a congregation what to do with your property. It does not condone or encourage any congregation to engage in activity that would be illegal. We are not telling you you have to, and we are not encouraging you to do so. There will be congregations that want to. They have the right to do that in our polity. You, you, you may not know this, but they don't always listen to the bishop. <laughs> that happens. Okay, we are going to have to figure out what this means. But it needs to be very clearly stated that that is not what a sanctuary declaration meant in the course of our assembly. Now, we are not naive in that we don't know that word is loaded. That is a loaded political term. But friends, here's my challenge to you and to me and to us as a church. Sanctuary is our word. It is a theological word. It is a house of worship. When we dedicated this place, we dedicated a sanctuary, a holy place. And what has happened is that word has become defined by the left and the right in ways that encourage us to fight one another rather than to come together and to say, how do we serve our neighbors? How do we serve those who are in need? How do we serve those who are lost? How do we serve those who are coming from places seeking refuge and asylum? How do we serve the communities that we are called to serve? We need to think theologically about what this word means. We need to think outside of partisan political thing, thinking and say, what does it mean for us to be Lutheran Christians serving our neighbors today in this deeply divided time? The world is going to try to rip us apart. The partisan political gains that can be held by tearing us apart, there are people who are going to try to do that. The challenge we have put to ourselves is to say, can we talk about it with each other? Can we have a conversation together? There will be people on one side of the spectrum who are very upset that we even use this term at all. There will be people on another side of the spectrum who, when I hear what I'm saying right now, are going to be deeply disappointed that the bishop is backtracking from this bold statement. That's just reality. That's called leadership. Somebody's always a little pissed off at you. But I'm telling you, this is what it says. This is what we're doing. And when other people tell you otherwise, say no. Read the actual memorial. Look at the polity of the ELCA. And then let's, be, let's do something that the world doesn't do right now. Let's talk to each other. Let's have a conversation. And let's look at the people around the world, you are a global community because of your connections to the LWF. Let's look at the people around the world and say, who is my neighbor and how am I called to serve? And how do we break over and break down these barriers of division that divide us so deeply? That's something we're gonna talk about as synod for the next year. 
Our next Senate Assembly next fall is gonna be in South Dallas at Paul Quinn College the oldest HBCU, historically black college and university in the state of Texas. We're going to South Dallas on purpose because I know there are divisions in our neighborhoods. So how do we as Lutherans say we want to cross over barriers between north and south and east and west? I'm happy to talk to any of you about this personally. I know you've got a forum conversation about it coming up. I just encourage you to educate yourself, educate yourself on what the work of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services is doing and do something that the world's not doing right now, which is listening hard to each other and to your neighbor and to have conversation across those barriers that we set up. Now I'm starting to preach, so I should probably just go into preaching, okay? But I'm happy again to speak to any of y'all afterwards about this, and I know your pastor will be as well, as long as you're council president, uh, so please do so. Let's have a word of prayer. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable, O God, in your sight. Amen. I mean, the reality is the gospel for today is pretty well suited for this conversation. I mean, if you listen to what Gary talked about in his children's sermon, I, you stole pretty much the first five minutes of my sermon, Gary, which is good because I went a little long with the first part of this. But just to recap, uh, so Jesus is teaching in the synagogue on, on the Sabbath, right? Uh, he's in there teaching, and uh, this woman comes who's been bent over by a spirit for 18 years. And Jesus sees her, and he cures her. And then the leader of the synagogue, the, well, the bishop, uh, right? Episcopus means overseer. Uh, so if there were a Greek-speaking synagogue, they might have called this person an episcopus. Uh, you know, he, was, he says, what are you doing? You have six days to do this work. Why are you doing it today? You're breaking the rules. You're violating the law. He's got a point, a very, very good point. The law is a gift from God. The law was given by God to the people on purpose. The law was given to them so that they and their descendants might live. Read back in the Old Testament, what is the law for? Write it on your lips, put it in your hearts, tell it to your children so they can know who is the Lord, the one who created the world and who rested on the seventh day, and gave that day as a gift, because guess what, folks? We all work too much. He isn't joking. This isn't silly. I think sometimes we think about these, and we read these stories in the gospel, and we see uh, the, the leader of the synagogue, and we think, oh, he's just some old religious coot. And he's like that bishop up there talking. Well, they said, I'm interesting. I don't know if I'm interesting or not, but the thing is, this was serious. We read in Isaiah today. Keep the Sabbath, and you will be known as what? The restorer of cities for people to live in. If you keep the Sabbath, if you honor the Sabbath, you are going to be the kind of people that rebuild that which has been destroyed. You will be repairers of the breach. That's what Isaiah says. If you honor the law, that's who you're going to be. So they're not just messing around. These are people that live under Roman occupation. Typically, when the Romans would come in and occupy a nation, they would wipe out the other religion. They'd just build their own temples. They'd say, no more. You worship our gods, which meant you worship the emperor. But guess what? The Jews were really stubborn. And the Romans said, well, your religion's pretty old, so you know what? We're going to let you keep it, but only if you behave. We're going to give you a puppet king who's going to keep you in line, but we're going to send a governor just to watch over. That's that whole Pontius Pilate Herod thing that we get to later. This is life and death. This isn't just some silly old rule that a person in a stole and a, with a pectoral cross is telling you to follow. It's life and death for these people. And there goes Jesus breaking the rules. Why does he do it? Why does he do it? Well, I think Jesus does it because this is part of what Jesus came to do, right? Jesus did not come to uphold the status quo. I don't know if you were here last week and heard the lesson last week where Jesus said, I come to bring fire. I come to set family against each other, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. I don't know if you need Jesus to do that. Um, 
And I said, I don't usually preach. I was at Emmanuel in Dallas, one of our Latinx congregations, and I was with them, and I said, you know, I don't normally preach this to my young people because here's the thing, I want them to listen to me and obey the status quo, right? I tell them Jesus wants them to be good young children who pray nicely and do what they're told, who don't get their car out this morning five minutes before we're going to leave and start driving it around on the counter and knock things over. <laughs> that was my three-and-a-half-year-old an hour and 25, 30 minutes ago. I need to go to church But Jesus didn't come to just preserve the way things were. He came to give a new law. He came to give life. And he came to give hope. And so he upsets the apple cart. And he heals this woman on the Sabbath. He heals her and he calls out the religious leaders and say, Who are you serving? Who are you really serving with your insistence on this? You will go feed your donkey, but you prefer this daughter of Abraham to be bent over. Who? Who's important in your life? Well, yeah, your donkey should be important. Livestock are important. I don't know if there are any farmers in South Lake, but we have farmers and we have folks in our synod who depend on their livestock, who depend on the land to grow and to thrive. Those things are important, right? You feed your donkey. You give him water. He says, but it's still a donkey. This is a daughter of Abraham who Satan has bound for 18 years. What am I going to do? I'm going to set her free. One of the great gifts I have as being a bishop is I get to do ordinations. And Catherine's here a couple months ago. Last week on Friday, I was in Lexington, South Carolina, as we ordained a young woman named Sarah Derrick to be the pastor, the associate pastor at Faith Lutheran in Flower Mount. Uh, so we in Texas think we've got a little bit of history, like we go to the Alamo. That's kind of neat, you know, whatnot. So uh, this congregation, Zion Lutheran in Lexington, South Carolina, was founded in 1740. Okay, they kind of think we're cute. <laughs> and Sarah is from four generations. She's the fourth generation pastor in her family. Pretty powerful stuff. And then she comes forward, and I lay hands on her. We pray over her. And you know what we do in that moment? And I don't do it. It's not me. It's us as the church. What we do in that moment, we say, Sarah, we're giving you the office of the keys. We're giving you what Jesus gave to Peter, to bind and to loose, to bind sin and to set free from sin. And we give that power to Sarah to say, you are forgiven. Rise and walk. That's what we as a church are called to do because of what Jesus has done for us. That's what Jesus said to those leaders in the synagogue. He said to them, what am I supposed to do to watch her remaining bound by Satan for another day? Or she can just wait another day? No. No, today I set her free. Stand and walk. And he does that because, as the author of Hebrews reminds us, friends, these things of the world are temporal, and they are shaking. I mean, this is the reality. Nations come and go. Churches come and go. Denominations come and go. They rise and they fall. They are shaken. That's what the author of Hebrews was saying to the people. The Roman Empire, as great as it was and as powerful as it was, did not last. But the thing that cannot be shaken is the promise of God, the promise of God that is with us always, and that God wants us to be free, and God wants to set you free, not so that you can hold it in for yourself and hoard it for your own, but so that you can give it away for the life of the world. That's the challenging message. I think this is the gift of grace that we have as Lutheran Christians to proclaim here in northern Texas is that we have a gospel that says you are taken care of. You don't need to worry at all. You can give everything you have away because guess what? The only thing that really matters is that God is for you. And that's what Jesus was saying about that, young, that, that woman who came. Jesus was saying, I want to be very clear that God is for her, this daughter of Abraham today. He shakes the foundations to establish the firm foundation. And that's what we're called to do as well. So in all that we do, friends, as church, 
may you know that you have been set free. We give thanks for who you are as abiding grace and the work that you do, crossing borders, crossing barriers in our synod, engaging the other, the work you do supporting our ministries in Alvarado, in the prisons, the work you do raising up leaders. We are grateful for all that you do. But at the end of the day, friends, remember, you don't ever do it for the glory of abiding grace. You don't even do it for the glory of the bishop. You do it because God has set you free. And God calls you to look for those who are bent over and in need of grace, and to say to them, God is for you, rise and walk. Amen.